gathers us into his house, blesses us with his presence. Before we get started, we have a few announcements to get to. Uh, our Sunday school children will be singing at the second service today, so uh, we'll wait until second service to, uh, to invite them to come up. But just so you know, if you don't stay for the second service, you're going to miss out on hearing our Sunday school kids sing. Uh, there will be no Sunday school next Sunday because it's MEA break. Uh, some families are going away, including my own family, so I'll be alone, but that's okay. Um, but we will have Bible class next Sunday. So if you uh, are, are interested in coming to Bible class, we will still have that next Sunday. Uh, fall supper's coming up next month on November 8th. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table to the right side with all kinds of uh, opportunities for you to help out. Uh, so if you'd like to volunteer in any way, uh, please use that sign-up sheet to do that. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet on the round table in the middle for uh, those looking to help with trunk or treat, uh, whether you're going to decorate your car or you're going to bring in uh, some kind of donation or you're going to bring in money so that you can uh, use that money for some kind of donation. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that. There's also a sign-up sheet back there for our trip to the ARC exhibit and the Creation Museum. Uh, I have already been speaking with some of the local bus companies in the area trying to price out some different options. Um, I'm expecting to get the final details on that sometime this week and I'll be able to let you know next Sunday and the Sunday after that uh, what the cost will be for those who want to go. Um, but if you would like to, to go, uh, I strongly encourage you to sign up on that sheet back there uh, and then I can find out from you what, what works best for you. Uh, I don't know if you know who Sheila Qualls is, but she's the person behind uh, the uh, podcast Trapped Chaos in the Classroom. Uh, she will be at the Montevideo Community Center on October 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, I know one person for sure is planning on going to that, so if you'd like to ride along with my wife, let her know. Um, or you can drive down there yourself, it's not that far. Uh, there will be no confirmation this week, again, due to MEA break. Uh, we will be back in session on October 25th. Uh, this Tuesday, so a couple nights from now, the LWML is meeting uh, at 7 o'clock. Um, I will not be there. Uh, my son has practice that night, but Tracy will be there, so you can uh, visit with her if you like. Um, and I think there's a bunch of other announcements in the bulletin as well that I'm not going to rehash right now, but please, as you, as you have the opportunity, uh, check them out. Today's order of service is Divine Service Setting 4. It's all printed out for you in your bulletins. We begin now by singing our opening hymn, hymn 803, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. May God bless our time of worship.
take our beginning now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. O Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The opening sentences for today are taken from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We now sing the Kyrie to the tune of Amazing Grace.
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The epistle reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Christians living in Philippi, the, cha the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. We rise now for the reading of the gospel and prepare for it by speaking responsibly the gradual and verse. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the nice things about having a DVR is that I don't have to watch commercials. I can fast forward through them. I still do have to see them, but I get to blow through them at a much quicker pace. One of the commercials, however, that I just can't seem to avoid is the one about providing relief to people with STDs. Now, I don't know what their health issues are, but I'm sure that they're not good. But rather than repenting and living in the way that God has commanded all people to live, they've turned to the drug companies instead to save them from the consequences of their sins. And of course, the most serious consequence of all is death. That's what these drugs are supposed to prevent, death. Unfortunately, it's not just the sinful choices that people make with their bodies that can lead to untimely death. Wars also can do that. We've seen the atrocities that have gone on in Israel for the past week with Hamas terrorists uh, raping, torturing, and killing people, even women and children. Before that, it was, and still is, Ukraine. And for as long as any of us have been alive, they've been killing one another in African countries, especially Christians. And let's not forget about abortion. Millions of children have been murdered and had their lives snuffed out due to the sinful selfishness of their parents. As one radio commentator put it just this week, we are living in a culture of death. I think he's right. As much of an oxymoron as that statement might be, it's nonetheless true. We are living in a culture of death. If only there was some way out of all this senseless death. Well, there is. In today's Old Testament reading, the prophet Isaiah talked about a glorious mountaintop banquet. And at that feast, there was rich food of every kind offered up to whomever was there. But even better than the food was this promise. God will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. That's right, dear friends in Christ. On that holy mountain to come, there will be no more death because the Lord God will have devoured it and destroyed it forever. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus told basically the same story. His parable, however, had a few more details. For one thing, he said that all people would be invited to this glorious banquet. Unfortunately, he said, the ones who were invited first refused to come. In fact, they beat the prophets sent to invite them to that banquet and even killed some of them. So after that, the king chose to invite everyone else to his son's banquet feast, both the good and the bad. Now, in both cases, the tellers of these tales were talking about the kingdom of heaven. This is the wedding feast of the Lamb that we talk about so often here in church. It's the place where fears and tears will be wiped away. And in their place, God will give us joy and peace. Death will be no more. And life will be given to all who accept God's invitation. And all people have been invited to this glorious feast. Unfortunately, not everyone will accept God's invitation. In fact, most people won't. Instead, they'll busy themselves with their earthly vocations, which in and of itself is not a bad thing. But when it's the reason that they can't or won't hear God's invitation, then it's a very bad thing. But such was the response of the folks who were first invited by the king. They paid no attention to the king's messengers and went back to their daily business. Some of them even treated the king's messengers shamefully and killed them. So what did Jesus say what happened to those degenerate sinners? He said that they would, along with the false believers who tried to sneak into the banquet hall, all of them would be cast out into 
the darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus noted in the parable that he said that one person did get in without wearing the appropriate clothes. Now, most theologians, including myself, think that that meant he refused to repent of his sinful life. For although many are called, few repent of their sinful works. And so few are chosen by God for inclusion in his kingdom. But that doesn't change the fact that all people have been invited to this holy feast. Isaiah wrote, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food. Christ Jesus himself said that this meal included oxen and fattened calves. As the commentator of Isaiah mentioned, this is the eschatological feast of the Lamb. It is his victory celebration, the one that goes on forever and ever. As we remember every Easter tide season, this is the celebration of the Lamb's victory over death. And since he has defeated death, we also will now live forever. And what better way to celebrate our Lord's victory over death and the grave than to receive the greatest food of all, his body and his blood. This is the Lord's Supper that we celebrate twice a month here at St. Mark's. But in heaven, we will get to celebrate it every day of every week of every year for eternity. This is the great feast that God's prophets had spent so much of their earthly ministry trying to get people to attend. But again, sadly, most people refused. They didn't want God to be their God. And they certainly did not want to be his people. Countless times the prophets cried out to the people of Israel. And countless times God's people refused to heed their call. As I have worked my way through the scriptures, it is amazing to me the number of times that God's people refused to act like God's people. Instead, they have chosen to act like the other nations. And they've worshipped the gods of those nations. They broke God's holy covenant by making deals with other nations, by intermarrying with their godless people, and by putting their trust in the false idols of the other nations rather than trusting the God who led them out of their Egyptian slavery. So God's people had to deal with his justified wrath. Just prior to today's Old Testament reading, God warned his people about all the bad things that were soon going to happen to them. But then, in today's Old Testament reading, he offered them this peace offering that all people, all of the good and all of the bad, all of them were invited to his heavenly victory feast. And the only requirement that God required of them was that they believe. And of course, the only way that they could show that they believed was by living like the saints that God had <laughs> created them to be. So they had to repent of their sinful and selfish ways and lead good, godly lives. Now, the good news for everyone is that there's nothing that can disqualify us from going there to that heavenly banquet feast to come, except unbelief. Unfortunately, there are a lot of unbelievers in the world today, and that includes the hypocritical believers who say they have faith, but they have no good works to show for it. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. So if anyone refuses to do any kind of good works, their faith is not real. It's dead. Just like Jesus' brother, James, said it was in his letter to Christians. For those who do good works and who do them regularly, they can experience the hope of eternal life. But of course, good works do not save anyone. They are merely the outward expression of inward, authentic faith. That's the kind of faith that saves. The kind that God looks favorably upon. And it's the work of the church, of each one of us, to encourage those good works in others. So that they can, by their actions, show that their faith is real. It's our job to invite them to God's banquet and encourage them to live like the saints that God has already made them to be through 
baptism and our Lord's Supper. Speaking of our Lord's Supper, that is the greatest of all foods, you know. It's not pizza or ice cream or any other such delicacy. Our Lord's body and blood is the greatest because it feeds our faith and it nourishes our souls. And when we receive it, and even when we don't, our response should always be the same. We give thanks to God for all of his good and gracious ways. And we should, by daily contrition and repentance, drown that old Adam in us and put him to death. And then by faith in God's promises, uh, the new Adam be raised up again to new and everlasting life. Isaiah said, it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. That waiting with hope that God will do what he's promised to do is just another way of saying faith. They trusted that God would do what he said he would do. And so they waited patiently for him to do it. Jesus also said that everyone was invited to the king's son's wedding feast, both the good and the bad. Please take note of that. If you're hearing that message and you think that you could never be worthy of being one of God's people, you're wrong. And I want to especially direct this to those of you who are maybe watching online or listening on the radio. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. All that matters is what you do now and what you do going forward. If you repent of your past sinful ways, God is faithful and just. He will forgive you and he will cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. The proof for God's faithfulness was seen in the resurrection of his son Jesus. Death could not hold him. Anyway, in any, uh, if anything, he held it. And he swallowed it whole. When he rose up from the grave victoriously, it wasn't just his triumph. It was our victory as well. After all, since we've been baptized into his death, we have also been baptized into his resurrection and raised up with him to new life. And his new life means new life for us all. That's a victory that won't be fully revealed until we ourselves rise up from the graves and ascend to our heavenly, eternal home. Therefore, as Christians, we should be joyful at all times, knowing that God has done all things for us through the death, resurrection, and ascension of His Son. As Paul wrote in today's New Testament reading, we should rejoice. We should not be anxious about anything, but instead with prayer and thanksgiving to God, we should let our requests be made known to God. And his peace will guard and keep our hearts in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Finally, dear friends in Christ, how can we know that God will bless us in all our ways from this time forth and even forevermore? Because he himself has said so. Isaiah wrote after he talked about the heavenly feast, For the Lord has spoken. And we know that when God spoke, his word was the instrument by which he created and forgave and saved all things. And that includes each one of us. Therefore, let us rejoice and be glad, for God has spoken. He has swallowed up death forever and given us everlasting life. May the name of the Lord be praised, now and forevermore. Amen. I would direct you now to your bulletin where we have a confession of faith that we sing to the tune of immortal, invisible, God only wise.
As the offering plates are, plates are brought forward, I invite you to rise and join together in singing the offertory, which is hymn 785.
the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We now sing our closing hymn, The Lord is my shepherd.